If you're planning a trip to the United Kingdom, and especially if you're traveling with family, then this is one video you definitely don't want to miss. Hi everyone, my name is Jharna and welcome back to my channel Journalist. So we're recently back from a family vacation to the United Kingdom. My family of four that comprises my twin nine-year-old boys, my husband and I had an adventurous trip and we all really enjoyed it despite a few minor hiccups along the way. Now while planning our trip, I had to hunt for information in a lot of different places. And that's the reason I decided to create this exhaustive video for all those families in India who are planning a trip to London or Scotland or any other part of the United Kingdom. This one video will answer all your questions and this is that one video you definitely want to watch. I'll be going over the visa process, flights to the UK, getting around once you're in the UK, accommodation, bookings, reservations, navigating tourist spots, helpful apps and groups and websites, and much, much more. Do note that all the links or websites that I mentioned will be linked to below in the description box. And also later in this video, I will be sharing with you five essential factors to consider before even thinking of planning a family vacation to the United Kingdom. So stay tuned for that. If you and your family are Indian passport holders, then you will need to apply for a standard visitor visa to the UK. This visa is applicable for all tourism purposes and it's available for a minimum of up to six months. And you will need to head to the UK government's website, which will guide you through to the actual application that you can then fill in and submit online. The price for a six month standard visitor visa is a hundred pounds and that works out to approximately ten and a half thousand rupees based on the current currency conversion rates. Filling out the visa application in itself is quite a tedious process. There is no provision for a family application. So for example, for a family of four, you will need to fill out four separate applications and some details will have to be entered repeatedly, like your addresses, the sponsor details, the source of your funds, etc. Do keep all your current and previous passports handy while filling these application forms because some details like all the previous international trips that you've undertaken over the past 10 years will need to be furnished. You will also need to guesstimate and furnish details like your average monthly spend, how much you intend to spend during the trip and more. Once you submit the applications, you can pay the visa fees online and book an appointment at your nearest BFS center. Bangalore's is located in Gopalan Mall on Banirgata Road. Supporting documents like account statements, employer letter, flight tickets, etc. can be uploaded onto the portal and do not necessarily need to be carried physically for the visa appointment, but we did just for safety's sake. While traveling to the VFS Center for your visa interview, do remember to carry printouts of your visa application receipt and the document checklist which you need to download, as well as your passports of course. Photographs are taken at the center so you don't need those for the application and neither do you need to carry them with you. Lines are not too bad at the VFS so don't fall into the scam of opting for a premium lounge there. There are additional charges for SMS updates and visa courier which we did opt for. So at the moment the UK visa processing takes approximately between 10 days to 2 weeks but this could change at any given point of time. So that's why I would strongly advise you to apply for your UK visa as much in advance as possible. Now flight tickets to the UK can either be booked before you get your visa or after you get your visa. We decided to book in advance to ensure that prices would not jump any further because they were already skyrocketing and also perhaps to aid in the visa process. I wanted to fly directly to London as I was traveling alone with the kids on our way there while my husband joined us later. The only option for me from Bangalore was British Airways, but from cities like Mumbai or Delhi, there are other direct flights run by airlines like Air India, Vistara and Virgin Atlantic. You could also opt to take a stopover, which will in all likelihood further reduce your ticket prices. I'd recommend setting up alerts at places like Google Flights or Skyscanner to get acquainted with prices for your chosen dates and book as early as possible especially if you're planning to visit in the summer months, which is peak season in the UK. 
If you're flying to London via British Airways like we did, you will land at Heathrow's Terminal 5, while my husband who flew Vistara from Delhi landed at Heathrow Terminal 3. There are other flights from India that land at other airports in London like Gatwick. To get from Heathrow to London City, you can either take the Heathrow Express, which is well connected to the tube, or you can book an Uber or a Bolt, which is more likely when you have children and extra luggage along with you. In this day and age, one of our first priorities when traveling internationally is that we should be able to use our phone. Being able to make calls, use WhatsApp and have internet access for maps, payments and so much more is an absolute necessity. So when you're headed to the UK, your first option is of course to get international roaming on your own number. If you have Airtel, they have plans depending upon the number of days and you will most likely need to opt for the 10 or 30 day plans which cost 3000 and 4000 respectively. The other option you have is to get a local UK number in the form of either a physical SIM or an eSIM. You need to check which will work with your handset. Local prepaid SIMs can be ordered in advance or you can purchase them on arrival at the airport or supermarkets or convenience stores. So for our trip as a family, we ended up using Airtel International Roaming for one handset and then we used a local eSIM for my phone and a local physical SIM for another phone. Uh, the local SIMs were from Leica Mobile and they were very reasonable. Moving on to travelling within the UK. Now the United Kingdom comprises of England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland and your UK visa will allow you to travel to all these places. My kids and I travelled to the UK for about two weeks and my husband joined us for 10 days. And it was our first time there, so we couldn't see everything. So we instead focused on visiting our friends in St Albans, staying in London for a week and we spent four days in Scotland covering Edinburgh and the Highlands. I'll discuss travelling within London in a bit, but first let's focus on travelling between different parts of the United Kingdom. The most popular form of transport is of course by train. Trains go practically everywhere in the UK. They are of really good quality and are usually reliable with good frequency and connectivity. Train travel is basically comfortable, convenient and fun. Outbound trains from London are available at stations that are directly connected to several local underground stations. National Rail handles the train network across Great Britain, which means England, Wales and Scotland. And it uses the double arrow logo, which you will find at stations, maps, apps and more. We personally ended up travelling by train a few times. First the kids and I went from St Albans, which is a town just northwest of London, to Farringdon in London on our way to visit a friend. Then we travelled back from Edinburgh in Scotland to London by train. And we also made our way to and fro Watford, where the Harry Potter studio is located, with the help of the National Rail Service. When booking train tickets, you can either go by the National Rail website or the Trainline app on your phone. There are several ways to save money and get good discounts, and these include by booking in advance, booking tickets for off-peak hours, which will be listed, by booking for a small group together, in this case, your family, or by opting for a National Rail card, a national rail card will cost you about £30, but one like the family and friends rail card will give you one third off rail fares for up to four adults and 60% off for up to four kids between the ages of 5 and 15. So even if you just make a couple of trips via train, you will recover your money and save quite a bit more if you go ahead with this option. While travelling by train within the UK might be the most common and popular mode of transport, don't discount budget flights. For a trip to Scotland, flying out of London to Edinburgh worked out to be cheaper than taking the train. So that's why one way we opted for that, taking a low-cost EasyJet flight from London's Luton Airport. Do be mindful that budget airlines are only likely to allow you to carry a purse or backpack and you will have to pay additional for any extra luggage. Renting a car for self-driving is another option that works well for a lot of different families, but that is when you're travelling outside London and into the countryside. Like India, UK still drives on the left, so there is no adjustment needed. From our experience, it would be wise to rent a car from larger players like Enterprise and Avis, 
even though they might be a bit more expensive, and avoid smaller players that you may see on sites like Booking.com or other websites as they have not so good insurance policies and are very stringent on international licenses and other factors. Depending upon your car rental service, you may need an IDP. That is an international driver's permit and that will set you back by about 80 pounds. I will share the link to that as well. When traveling by car, it's important to note that children under 135 centimeters need to be in either a car seat or booster seat depending upon their height. I'll link below to the UK government's official car seat rules criteria, so do take a look at that. You can either rent car seats in the UK or carry them with you from India. It comes under hand carry, and like strollers or prams, if it is too large to fit overhead, it will most likely be taken from you and returned to you at the boarding gates. Do double check with your airline on this. Now if you're traveling to the UK from India, you will more than likely be spending some time in London. And London is a huge metropolis. So let's discuss how to travel across this hustling and bustling cosmopolitan city. I also will be sharing our 7-day itinerary in London, 4-day itinerary in Scotland, and 100 places to visit and things to do with kids in London in my upcoming videos. So don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the bell icon as I'm sure you don't want to miss those. Now coming to London, first a small lesson in geography. London has a river running through the city called the River Thames. It is spelt as Thames but pronounced as Thames. The entire city has been divided into nine zones, starting from the centre of the city which is Zone 1 to the outskirts of the city which is Zone 9. The zones have been created in order to help the transport system calculate the distance you travel and thereby charge you accordingly. Now, like in India, Google Maps is a great way to see how to get from one place to another. But in addition to that, I'd strongly suggest downloading the app City Mapper. City Mapper will also show you a variety of different modes of transport you can opt for, how much each will cost you, and compare how long each will take. It also does combinations like bus plus tube plus walking and the like, so definitely a good app to run by. Now moving on to the different ways of getting around the city. Due to the nature of London, you will spend a lot of time walking. So be mentally prepared for that even while using other modes of transport. What we in India refer to as the metro is called the underground in London, represented by this symbol, and is of course better known as the tube. London's tube has 12 different lines and nearly 300 stations that crisscross across the city, but it still doesn't go everywhere in London. There are ticket counters at London tube stations, but it is both easier and cheaper as a tourist to use a contactless credit card. So in case you're using a credit card in India, look for this symbol on it, which shows that it is contactless. That basically means you can tap and pay and do not need to insert into a card reader and use a pin. If you don't have a contactless credit card, it makes absolute sense to get one from your bank before traveling to the United Kingdom. Also ensure that your credit card is enabled for point of sale international transactions. Couple things to keep in mind while using a contactless card on the tube. Every individual tapping in needs to use a separate card. And you not only need to tap in at the station you get on from, but you also need to tap out at the station you get out from and that's how they calculate how much to charge you. Another alternative is by using a visitor Oyster card, which you can purchase in advance or on arrival. It costs about five pounds and you can preload money on it in advance for use. In addition to the tube, an Oyster card can be used on other modes of transport in London, like the bus, the tram, the London Overground, the DLR, and most national rail services. An important point to note, if you're traveling with children, children under 11 are free on the tube. They don't need to pay or swipe anything. If you have kids with you, then go through one of the wider barrier gates for tapping in, as this will stay open for longer. If you're traveling with a child between the ages of 11 to 15, then you should get an Oyster card for them, because you can get the tube staff at any station you first travel from to add a young visitor discount to a visitor Oyster card. 
This will give them a 50% off on the regular adult fare. When traveling by tube to your destination, you may have to change through multiple lines which are all interconnected. So keep checking if you're headed in the right direction, like northbound or southbound and the like. And not to forget, always mind the gap between the train and the platform. The iconic red buses that most of us identify London with cover the entire city. Most routes run at high frequencies from early morning till late at night and some even operate 24 hours. If you're traveling with kids, you'll be happy to know that like the tube, buses too don't charge anything to kids under 11. For those above 11, the same Oyster card will work. Unlike the tube, however, passengers on a bus don't need to swipe out. Only swipe in once while getting on the bus. My children loved riding on the top of the double-decker buses. A popular way to travel by buses in London is via the hop-on, hop-off bus services. There are a few different providers like Big Bus, Golden Bus and Toot Bus. These buses offer you the ability to get on and off at their designated stops next to tourist attractions and landmarks over the course of the time your ticket provides for. Like one day or 24 hours or 48 hours. These buses are normally double-decker open-top buses that ply frequently and have pre-recorded commentary. It's generally considered to be a kid-friendly way to see all the popular spots in London. Another cheaper option is to travel by one of the normal bus leisure routes, which I will also share more details about in the description box below. There are other ways to travel across London. More expensive ways like Bolt cabs or the good old Uber, which works the same way as it does in India. And of course, London's famous black cabs. You can also travel across the Thames via the Thames Clipper or Uber boat or a cable car. And then there are cheaper options but not ones you're likely to opt for with families like cycles and scooters. Now coming to one of the major decisions while planning a trip to the United Kingdom, where to stay. As the size of your family increases, prices of your accommodation will shoot up to even almost double in several instances. That is, even if your children are quite young. Some tips that I would recommend to follow include booking in as much advance as possible. This will help in two ways. First off, you will have plenty more choices. We unfortunately booked quite late, so we didn't have too many options. And secondly, you can avail of discounted or saver rates. The UK gets very busy with tourist season from May to September, so planning as much ahead of time will be optimal. We went through popular apps like Agora and Booking.com to help shortlist and book. For families, what happens is when you add children to your hotel room selection, it will more than likely show up as two hotel rooms required. So what works out to be more convenient and slightly more economical than booking two hotel rooms is to instead opt for a family room or a serviced apartment that is designed to accommodate families. This especially holds true in large cities like London and Edinburgh, where space is always at a premium. In London, we opted to stay at Residence Inn, which is a serviced apartment chain run by Marriott. The rooms were very compact for a family of four, but otherwise we were happy with the service, hygiene and other facilities like breakfast that was included, a kitchenette and laundry facilities. They did have a sofa bed that was converted for the children, so we all slept fairly comfortably, which is what matters most. We also had the same sleeping arrangement in Edinburgh, where we stayed at a Novotel. When we were in the Scottish Highlands, where there was more luxury of space, the resort we opted for had cottages, which had a lot of room for families. Another place that I've heard works well for families are Premier Inns, that apparently have over 800 hotels all across the United Kingdom. When booking accommodation in big cities like London or Edinburgh, do take into account how centrally located that accommodation is and how close it is to different modes of public transport because that is guaranteed to save you a lot of precious time and energy. The concept of making advanced bookings is not only restricted to accommodation in the UK. Most restaurants work on a system of reservations and you may very well be turned down due to lack of place if you just walk in. So when you're traveling with kids, reserving a table ahead of time is a great idea. I also noted that a majority of restaurants in the UK have kids menus, several vegetarian and vegan options and also cater to those with allergies. Along with Google reviews, I found OpenTable to be a good source to shortlist restaurants.
you can also make bookings through open table Another thing to remember when dining out in the UK is that unlike Indian cities most places in the UK shut by 9 pm and sometimes even earlier pubs are open till later but with children that wouldn't be your preferred choice so do make dinner plans keeping that in mind for grab and go meals like sandwiches salads or ready to cook options you can also consider grocery based stores like Sainsbury Tesco and M&S food or like in Aberfeldie in Scotland we were frequenting a co-op supermarket Pretty Manger is another popular choice for grabbing a quick bite while you're out doing touristy things when it comes to cuisines british food itself is bland but most kids do like fish and chips i'd also definitely recommend trying out all other different cuisines available in a place like london i'll be sharing some theme based dining options with kids so do stay tuned to my other videos for that When in London there is a good chance you may want to catch one of the city's famous West End musicals. I'll be sharing a list of some popular choices with children, but a couple of tips for booking tickets. Once again, do try and book as much in advance as possible. Tickets to West End shows can be super expensive, but there are a few different ways to try for cheaper tickets as well. One is the Magical Monday offer by Disney Tickets. where every monday at noon a number of tickets for that week's performance will be available for 29.50 pounds through the disney tickets website these tickets will sell quickly and you will have a limited time to purchase them the musical matilda has a lottery that you can apply for and if you win you will get to purchase tickets at a heavily reduced rate of approximately 25 pounds the app today ticks is another great place to look for discounted tickets at the last moment And the TKTS official London Theatre ticket booth in the heart of Leicester Square is another great option for last-minute and discount theatre tickets. Tourist spots and attractions are a plenty in London and the rest of the United Kingdom. Some free, some at a cost, but even those that are free often have timings and are ticketed in order to limit the number of people at one time, like Sky Garden and some of the museums. So it's a good idea to create an itinerary in advance and make bookings accordingly. There are certain places that will be shut on specific days of the week or certain things that take place only on certain days like the changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace or the lifting of Tower Bridge. I will be including some of that information in the description box as well as my upcoming videos. So do take that into account and watch them before planning your own trip. There are certain places that offer combination tickets. which will provide entry to multiple attractions in the form of a package some examples are the london pass which gives you entry to 90 different attractions or tourist england lastminute.com that have combination tickets when opting for any of these do go through the attraction list on offer and make sure you would want to opt for multiple of them otherwise booking solo tickets may make more sense another factor is that things like the london pass have to be used within a specific time frame and even if you opt for a certain number of days they have to be consecutive days so be sure you can factor enough in to make it worthwhile and then only go ahead there are plenty of resources in order to help you plan your trip to the UK on the web but not all of it is catered towards families and information is spread out and hard to find I really hope this video managed to pack in a lot of the details that you need to know when planning a family trip to the United Kingdom. There are also two Facebook groups that I found extremely helpful and that I would like to recommend. The first one is London with Kids for travel and planning advice centered around visiting London with family. And the next one is Scotland with Kids travel planning tips and advice. You can post specific queries here and also gain a lot of information from other posts and replies. Before wrapping up, I can't forget what I promised to share with you at the start of the video. 5 essential factors to consider before even thinking of planning a family vacation to the United Kingdom. Number 1, the United Kingdom is expensive. This especially holds true for those of us from India when you look at the currency conversion rate. So planning a budget trip for a family isn't realistically possible. It still might be possible in some cases if this is a solo traveler trip or an adult only trip and you can manage to cut some corners like 
walking a whole lot more or uh, staying in youth hostels for example but this isn't possible when traveling with young children also the number of children you have will directly raise the cost of your accommodation which is a major factor number two you do not need to convert your currency that is rupees to pounds to travel to the uk you're much better off either using a forex card or a contactless credit card almost all businesses services and tourist places in the united kingdom accept contactless credit cards i even ended up borrowing some pounds from a friend of mine in the uk to keep with myself because i thought it would be important to have in case of an emergency but i did not end up using it at all or needing it at all number 3 there is a lot of walking to be done in the uk pretty much anywhere you go so do factor this in especially if you have young children if your children are too young to walk long stretches then do consider bringing a stroller with you or buying an umbrella stroller specifically for this trip When we visited New York with our children a few years ago when they were younger, we did end up buying two umbrella strollers and it was totally worth the price. Also, do bring a couple of good walking shoes with you to last you through the trip. Number 4, the next major factor to be taken into account is of course British weather. It is extremely varied and unpredictable, and you will often end up experiencing what feels like four different seasons but all in one single day. British rain of course has developed a bit of a bad reputation but we were extremely lucky not to have experienced it at all believe it or not and from what i've heard from the locals is that even when it does rain in the uk it does not pour especially if you compare it to what us desis are used to during the monsoon season number 5 the next important thing to remember is to always look out for family or group discounts Some tourist attractions and even some modes of transport offer these discounts in a variety of combinations and permutations. Some of these are applicable only during the off season like the one at the Tower of London. Don't forget to watch my other videos on our London and Scotland trip and I wish you and your family a wonderful time in the United Kingdom. See ya.